Good morning, church. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Pastor Tanya. The wrong teams, huh? So I'm from Sacramento, and we only have one professional sports franchise. It's the Kings, and so it's kind of like a curse you're just given if you're born there, that uh, you just kind of got to root for the home team, no matter how often they lose, and enjoy, you know, all your friends who are Laker fans get to watch their team win. It's just how it works. Well, I have really enjoyed this Sabbath already, and I'm really happy to be with, be with you all. Youth, and I know you're a little bit spread out, but I see a lot of you over here and a lot of you over here. You have done a tremendous job this morning in leading us in worship, so thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, to be honest, to the rest of you who usually lead out when it's not Youth Sabbath, you may have your work cut out for you to follow this, I think. Uh, I have enjoyed every part of it. I have loved the worship, the announcements. I loved the puppet show. Uh, the Camacho brothers, beautiful. The, the talent, thank you. But I think my favorite part of the service so far was that children's offering collection. <laughs> I don't know if you got to watch, but you have trained these young people well. One of them was going down your aisles like this. <laughs> How do you say no to that? So a, a really, really wonderful Sabbath already, and I'm very, very glad to be here with you. As Pastor Tanya mentioned, I, we've known each other for a bit. I first met Pastor Tanya when she was in high school, and I knew her when she was student body president at La Sierra University, and as she was youth pastor at Orange Coast, and a star seminary student at Andrews, and now associate pastor here at Laguna Niguel, and it has been a privilege to watch her growth and development as a leader, and I can just say that those of us at the conference are really grateful for her ministry here in Southeastern. Yes. One reason I'm really happy to be here is that this church reminds me a lot of the first church that I pastored at, which is your sister church down the coast at Oceanside. Imagine this. I'm 21 years old, just graduated college, and I get hired to move down to North County, San Diego. And I'm given an office where I can look out the window and see the Pacific Ocean. And one day I'm standing on the coast, breathing in that wonderful air, and I think to myself, this is nice. But you know where I really want to go? San Bernardino. <laughs> and so I went up to the Cala Mesa church to serve for a few years. But you know what? I loved it there too. And now for the last two years, I've gotten to serve as our youth director for this conference. And one reason I love working as the youth director for us in Southeastern is that I get to work with people who love young people. And I know today I'm speaking to both our youth for our Youth and Young Adult Sabbath and our former youth. And so I'm going to start with a question for our former youth. Do you love today's young people? Don't answer too quickly. Because when I ask you that, I'm not asking you, do you love today's young people as long as they become the way we want them to become? I'm asking, do you love today's young people right now as they are? And a second question, maybe even a little bit harder. Do you believe that God can speak to us adults through today's young people? Sometimes, if we're honest, we struggle with that idea a little bit. Because have you seen today's young people? We've seen some of them on stage. Again, you've done a great job. But have you seen them outside of the church? I mean, strange beings. And sometimes they can be just so difficult. The author Mark Twain said it this way. When your child turns 13... Put them in a wooden barrel and feed them through a hole. <laughs> when they turn 16, plug the hole. <laughs> or how about this? I'm going to be reading now. Tell me if this resonates. 
The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs, and tyrannize their teachers. Accurate? <laughs> Do you know who said those words? Socrates, 5th century BC. What that tells me is that feeling frustrated with our younger generations or identifying them purely by what we perceive to be their shortcomings has been happening since the beginning of time. And it probably always will. And to be honest, when I started in ministry, that was how I felt as well. If you had asked me if I loved young people, I would have given a resounding, yes, of course. But in reality, I only loved them for who I wanted them to become. But thankfully, God is gracious, and I was given the opportunity to spend time with young people. And as a youth pastor, you spend a lot of time with young people. And that was a very good thing because I quickly realized that my outward judgments of them were not accurate to their inward character. And I even got to learn so much about God, about how to connect with Jesus, about how to experience the church and to read scripture from the very young people I was called to pastor. As if God could speak to me through them. Imagine that. It reminds me of the little girl who was drawing in the back of her classroom one day, furiously drawing. And the teacher was walking by each desk looking until she reached the little girl in the back. She said, what are you drawing? Without looking up, the little girl said, I'm drawing God. The teacher laughed. She said, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, well, they will in a minute. And I can't tell you how often my experience with young people gave me a new picture of God. And I was so thankful for that. One time I was invited to speak for a chapel at one of our academies. And before I was set to speak, a young man, a freshman, went up front to give a special music in front of all of his peers. The courage that takes. When I was a freshman in high school, no way I could stand in front of all of my peers to do that, but he did, and he took the stage, and he put his trumpet to his lips, and he started to play, and it did not go well. He just, he blew it, no pun intended. It just did not go well. And then he struggled through a few extra notes, and then decided to put his trumpet down and run off stage and sit in his seat. You want to talk about an awkward silence. And then the school chaplain stood up and said, well, Pastor Aaron, come speak to us now. <laughs> and so I stood up, prepared with my message to tell those young people how much they had to learn and how much they had to change. And as I'm speaking, I'm noticing out of the corner of my eye that that young man sitting in the front row his face in his hands and his trumpet at his feet, sobbing. I'm noticing that one by one, his peers are getting up from their seat, softly tiptoeing over so as to be respectful of the speaker, not that they had to worry about that, but they did, and they'd sit next to him, and they just put their hand on his back. Or another one would come and sit by him and and just say something in his ear. And then a group of seniors walked over to him, surrounded him, and led him outside of the chapel. And after about 10 more minutes passed, they walked back in with him, and I knew what that meant. That was my cue to wrap it up. So I said, anyway, 
Jesus loves you, amen. I sat down, the Bible teacher got back up. Hey, thanks, uh, whatever your name was, listen, everybody. We have a chance right now to love one of our own. And he invited him back on stage. I thought, he's going to try again? And collectively, we all held our breath and said our prayers as he put that trumpet back to his lips, played that song, and he nailed it. And when he reached that last note, he held it out extra long. You could see the confidence return to him, and we all stood up and applauded as he finished. When he walked off stage, you know the first people were to surround him and tell him what a great job he did? Those seniors. And that was a special moment because it was one moment of many moments over my time as a youth pastor when I learned something from our young people. Because oftentimes when we as adults only want to stand up front and talk about how much they need to change, myself included, our young people are down on the ground living it out, going to where people are hurting and caring for them. I saw that time and time again, and it reminded me of one of my favorite passages. It's in Psalm chapter 100. It's a really short chapter. We could read it all, but I want to focus on the last verse, and that is just verse 5. Psalm 100, verse 5. It reads this way. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And this was something I had to learn, that God's faithfulness doesn't end with my generation or with your generation, but that God's faithfulness continues through all generations. And something you may be aware of is that from the dawn of the 1900s, every American generation has been named and explained. Perhaps some of you are history buffs in here and you'll be familiar with this. But we name our generations who are bonded together by living in this country during specific cultural landmarks and, and moments. And so, for example, those born between 1900 and 1927, we call them the greatest generation. They're identified by their coming of age during World War and Great Depression and their strong sense of perseverance and integrity. And those of us in this country can be grateful for the greatest generation. Well, those who came after them, those born between 1928 and 1945, we call them the silent generation because they were the only generation of the century who were smaller than the one that preceded them, but also because of how they were dedicated to their careers in the face of threats of treason but they were also our leaders in the civil rights movement. And we can be thankful for the silent generation. Well, then we had those born between 1946 and 1964. And they are, of course, known as the baby boomers. We know where that name comes from. There was that post-war population spike. And baby boomers were the first ones to make us think of generations in terms of generations of having this collective identity. And they brought incredible cultural and, and political reform to our country. They, they changed us in profound ways, and we can be thankful for our baby boomers. And those who then were born in 1965 to 1980, well, they're known as Generation X. Some know them as the latchkey kids because, you see, the dynamics of the home changed at that time, and there were a lot more single-parent households, and there were a lot more women in the workforce, and so often those who grew up in Gen X, well, they got dropped off at home, and they had their keys around their neck, and they let themselves into the house. And some say this created a spirit of, of apathy, but in reality, this created a great spirit of independence and entrepreneurship, and it's Generation X who have been our guides into the technological age. And we can thank them for many of the things we now use and take for granted every day. We're grateful for Generation X. Well, my generation, we're known as 
millennials born between 1981 and 1996, known for lots of things. Sometimes that millennial word isn't used in the most kind of ways, but, but we have a few identifying characteristics. You know, we developed that thing we call the selfie. We're known for you know, living at home with our parents for quite a long time and, and having lattes and avocado toast in our hands and all these things. But in reality, we can be thankful for our millennials. They're the most educated generation that we've ever had, both our men and our women. And they're known for being very compassionate and, and active and caring. And, and we can thank God for millennials too. And then we have another generation. They're known as Generation Z. Those born between 1997 and 2012. Of course, there's another generation after that, those born after 2012. So if you are, let's see, uh, nine years old or younger, well then, you have a generation too. Known as, uh, some are calling them Generation Alpha. I prefer the name Baby Zoomers, but whatever you call them, we're still learning a lot about that newest generation. Not much you can know yet when you're, you know, eight years old, but we're still also learning about Generation Z, and, and I want to talk about them, because when we think about all these generations that we just discussed and, and, and what we can celebrate, my question is, does it also apply to Gen Z? Because they're different as well. Has God's faithfulness continued in this generation? And as we're still learning about Gen Z and, and those identifying characteristics, what I can tell you is what we do know already about Gen Z is so wonderful. So a few things. We, we know that this generation of young people, they have this incredible gift of making everybody feel welcome and like they belong, even if they're a little bit different. When I was in youth group in Sacramento, we looked at other church youth groups as our rivals. You see, we had our youth pastor, we had our worship team, we had our ways of doing things, and they had theirs. And then when I started as a youth pastor, my youth group said, hey, Pastor Aaron, can we do a joint vespers with the other Adventist youth group in town? I said, why? They said, well, we both follow Jesus and it'd be fun to be together. I said, okay, and then we did it, and it was beautiful. And then I went to my next church and my next youth group, and they wanted to do the same. They didn't care if we went to different churches. They saw us all as part of the same team. It reminds me of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Disciples from all over, believers from all over coming together. They didn't even speak the same language but the Spirit of God united them together because that's what the Spirit of God does. It breaks down these barriers to the point that Paul could even write that there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. No, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And today's young people are really good at that. And we can thank God for that. Today's young people are also very resilient. We talked about some of the different factors that contributed to the upbringing of previous generations, including some of the challenges. Well, what are some of the challenges that our young people have had to grow up in today? Well, unfortunately, the list is not short, right? We think of things like global terrorism, economic fallout, school shootings, political discord, and let's just throw in a global pandemic. But despite that, our young people are often the ones encouraging us to see the beauty in every person and in every circumstance, and we can celebrate that. Even in their behavior, which I know, you know, we, we give, you know, a lot of criticism for, and of course it doesn't mean it's, it's not due sometimes, but we can also celebrate our young people's behavior because research shows us unequivocally that in this generation as teenagers, compared to all of our generations when we were teenagers, today's young people drink less, they smoke less, teen pregnancies are at record lows, and we can be thankful and proud of them for how they're making these changes happen. And it reminds me again of something that Paul said, you know, when he wrote to Timothy, and he said, hey, don't look down, don't let people look down on you because you are young, but set the example. 
in speech and conduct and faith and in purity. You be the example of, as a young person, and I will tell you, many of your young people, they're setting the example, and we can celebrate that as well. So thank you for doing that. We're learning from you as best we can. But I want to tell you my favorite thing about this generation that we get to support and love on is how they want to impact the church. Because part of my job is to talk to young people in different churches and talk to their youth pastors. But when I talk to young people and I say, how do you want to see the Adventist church change in the next 10 years? Because the church will change, we know that. The church is not a, a static entity, it's dynamic, it's, it's people, we're people. The church is always changing, and so I ask the young people, how do you want it to change? And consistently, the words that I hear are things like more peace, less division. They want more people coming through those doors and more people to feel welcome and more people to want to be Seventh-day Adventist. And that excites me. And it reminds me of Psalm chapter 100, verse 5. Could it be true that God is faithful through all generations? Although, frankly, we shouldn't be too surprised because there is a pattern and precedent for this throughout Scripture. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you will notice that again and again, God will call young people to lead the elder generations. God will empower young people to share the gospel in new ways. And I just want to briefly share a few of my favorite examples of this. Miriam is definitely one of them. Look, we all love Moses. Moses is amazing. But who was the one who crafted the brilliant plan to save baby brother Moses that allowed him to eventually be a leader? It was his sister Miriam. Or how about David? Slayer of Goliath, right? Future king. But the youngest of Jesse's eight sons who was given a chance to take the lead. King Josiah, put into a position of power at just age eight. I don't know if I would recommend that, but maybe because eventually he was the one who helped rediscover the scriptures that led to spiritual renewal. Another one of my favorites, which is lesser known, 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman's young maid. Great story. It's rather short, but check it out. Here's the Sparknotes version. Young girl, we're not even told her name, is taken captive from her homeland and forced to serve her captors. I can't even fathom how awful that would be. And yet when she hears that her master has this condition of leprosy, she speaks up and says that he should go and bathe in the river. And she has this idea that, that he's willing to listen to, which not only heals him, but brings him to the God of Israel. But the only reason that happened is because he was willing to listen to the idea of this young, nameless girl. One of my favorites is Joseph. What a story that is. And of course, what happens is that he's given a vision. And when Pharaoh has these dreams that nobody can interpret, he goes to Joseph and says, you know, sometimes you have this ability to kind of see things that I don't see. So here's what happened. Do you have any vision on this? And God provided vision there. And because of that vision that that young leader had, they were able to withstand those seven years of famine because where most people could only see the feast that they had already had, this young person had the ability to see what was still to come. And sometimes I think God helps young people see what is to come. But I think my very favorite example of all are the disciples. Have you ever thought about like could Jesus not find anybody better? <laughs> like, like, this is a pretty important task and, and mission he had, and those are the 12 he chose to surround himself with? Young and uneducated people who frankly didn't have the greatest reputations in the community. But that's who Jesus chose. And I think it's safe to say the reason was because of their willing hearts. 
And what's incredible to me is that it's those same young leaders who following Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, they're the ones that build the church. They're the ones who go and change the world. And they didn't call it Christianity at that time. They had a different name for it. What did they call it? They called it the way. They called it the way. And so God used this group of young people to show the rest of the world the way. And church, sometimes I think God still does. And young people who are here today, I want you to believe that. I want you to believe that God is still calling you to lead us. Yes, you have plenty to learn as well. I'm not saying you've got it all figured out. And church, the truth is, I have never met a young person who has said, Pastor, I have it all figured out. I know they may act like it sometimes. They may express their independence. Guess what? You probably did too when you were younger. But young people want to learn. They want to, they want to listen. They're observing and they want to grow. And so young people, continue to ask questions to your pastors, to your parents, to trusted adults. Keep learning, absolutely. But don't stop there. Because the Bible tells us about a God who is calling you not to wait for 20 years until you get your first, you know, gray hair to be a leader. But right now, right now, that God can use you to show us the way. The beauty of the church is that it's a place where every generation can come together and everybody's voice matters. And I want you to believe in that. And to the church here today, I want to encourage you, you clearly love your young people. You know how I know that? Because we just had an entire service led by your young people. So thank you, Laguna Niguel, for loving your young people. But I want to push you even more. Continue to invest in these beautiful people. Continue to believe that they have something to say. Continue to give them opportunities to lead the church. Support them with your time. Support them with your relationships. Support them with your finances. Support them with your prayers. Let's be a church that doesn't look at our young people and take the Socrates method. All right, and find every little thing we don't like about them and say, they should be more like me. <laughs> Yes, every generation is different, but guess what? God loves every generation and can use every generation. And my prayer is that you will partner together with your young people to do that. I'd like to close with just one final story. One other learning moment for me. Um, I was a pastor at Calamasa Church, and it was the end of the school year. So we're talking like mid-May, late May. And I brought my youth leaders together because it was time to plan our end of the year Vespers that we do every year. And when I brought them together for that meeting, I could see very quickly that they were not interested in this meeting. Not because they were being rude, because they were exhausted. And I asked them, hey guys, like, you know, what's going on? We got to plan this Vespers. And they said, Pastor Aaron, We're studying for finals. We have end-of-the-year projects. Sports season's finishing up. We just had to plan a banquet. We're just so tired. And I said, I understand, but we have to plan a Vespers. (laughs) And here's how that works. Step one, find a band. Step two, find a speaker. Step three, pick a game. Step four, most importantly, find someone to make us some food. We do those four things, voila, we've got a Vespers, you can go home and study. Well, they didn't want to do it that way. And one of them said, hey, Pastor Aaron, what if for this end of the year Vespers, we just rested? I said, (laughs) that's cute. Um, That's not how it works. But then another one said, you know, Pastor Aaron, that's not a bad idea because we're not the only ones feeling that way, this way. 
all of our peers at school, we're all feeling exhausted. We're not really feeling like putting on some big energetic program. Frankly, we need rest. And I said, well, how do you have a program where you come and rest? Well, that was the question I shouldn't have asked because then their ideas started flowing. And they came up with a rest vespers. They called it a respers, where they would come and in our youth room, which had different rooms around the big center room, every room would have a different theme of rest. So one room would be the art room, where you'd have soft music playing, watercolor paints, maybe some markers and crayons. Another room would be the nature room. We'd put in, you know, pretty flowers and plants and have the sounds of birds in the forest singing, maybe some stuffed animals, I don't know. Another room would be the silent room. I was like, hold on, what is the silent room? They're like, Pastor Aaron, our lives as teenagers are really noisy. So what if we had a room where it was a silent room? You can go in there, you can read the Bible, you can journal, it's just silent. And I'm thinking, I am so gonna get fired over this. <laughs> and then we talked about the big room. Here's what they came up with. We would have a wall where they could write down their praises and prayer requests and stick them to the wall. We would have a corner that would be set up like a kindergarten classroom so they could feel like they were kids again. You know, a little bookshelf with their favorite kids' books, a rocking chair, brightly colored rug. And then, on the stage, we'd have a cross. And about 20 feet away, we'd have a table with bricks and Sharpies. And on the bricks, they could write down what was stressing them out the most and weighing them down, pick up the heavy brick, walk it over, and lay it down at the foot of the cross. I said, what do you think, Pastor Aaron? I said, let's do it. A few weeks later, the date comes. I'm expecting five people to show up. I open the door. There's a line of twice as many kids as we usually have. I didn't even know some of them. <laughs> All that they were told was that we were going to have a Vespers where they could rest. When we let them in the door, we had a couple ground rules. One, they would take their shoes off. It relaxes you a little bit. Number two, they'd put their cell phones in a basket and they'd get it back at the end. Not one kid objected to this. Totally on board. Put their phones down, took their shoes off, and then I had something that I wanted. This was my only contribution. I called one of the moms. I said, during this event, in our little youth kitchen, can you bake cookies? Because that's a really nice smell. Yeah. <laughs> and so the whole place smelled like fresh baked cookies. And I just told them, the next hour and a half is your time. Enjoy your rest. Some of them went into the art room, some went to the nature room, the silent room, some of them went to the, 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 the bricks and began writing on it. One kid, he skipped all that. He just went straight to the kindergarten classroom. He laid down and fell asleep. He stayed asleep the entire hour and a half. I had to go to him at the end. I woke him up. I said, hey, we're done. He goes, that was great. <laughs> but you know what? I knew that he had just been completing three AP classes, he had finished a basketball season, I knew that young man was exhausted. And guess what? Sometimes on Sabbath, we can rest. And that's the rest he needed. We had the program, they went home, and I will tell you, church, in my 10 years as a youth pastor, that single event is the one I have gotten the most positive feedback on in my ministry. You know why? Because it wasn't my idea. <laughs> It was because the young people were given the chance to take the lead, to do something, frankly, a little bit different than I would do it. But they knew how to meet the need of the youth, of their peers, and they did that. And just a couple weeks ago, I looked at the Instagram page of that youth group. I'm not, you know, the youth pastor there anymore. And they're having another respers. <laughs> There was no band, there were no games, there was no sermon. It was the best Vespers ever. 
It truly is amazing how much we can learn from our young people.